And today I have the honor of presenting um, Professor Martha Lampland, who is a professor in, socio in the sociology department um, at the University of California in San Diego. Uh, she is actually an anthropologist among the historians uh, as she got I'm her, uh, she's, she's uh, using her influence there. Just talked about Professor Porter Such. <laughs> uh, um, so she's, she's an anthropologist among the sociologists. Uh, she is also the faculty director of the Science Studies program and has been running that for a few years and her talk today reflects uh, those interests. And in also an affiliate of critical gender studies, she got her PhD at the University of Chicago, uh, her undergraduate degree at the University of Minnesota, um, and I have to point out that she was also a Mellon postdoctoral fellow here at the University of Michigan and I won't say Crease. none. At Crease in 1987, 88. Okay, so, so we're very happy to have her back. I just want to tell you a little bit about her other scholarship. Um, she's uh, uh, published four books, or one is in publication, two co-edited co volumes, um, one called More Recent Standards and Their Stories, How Quantifying, Classifying, and Formalizing Practices Shape Everyday Life that she co-edited with Lee Starr, who is a luminary in the field of science studies. Um, as well as Martha herself is. Um, in 2000, she uh, co-edited a book called, which is now sort of required reading among anthropologists in the field, Altering States, Ethnographies of Transition in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, um, which she co-authored with the late Daphne Rudal and, and Mati Bunzel. Um, and then two uh, single authored books, uh, which have, have interesting parallelism in their titles. Her first book was called um, The Object of Labor, Commodification in Socialist Hungary, which was based on her fieldwork that was published in 1995 by the University of Chicago Press. Her forthcoming book is called The Value of Labor, The Science of Commodification in Hungary. So very different take on covering some of the same terrain, and we're going to hear some of that today. Uh, um, just a couple of her numerous articles, just because the titles are so good. Um, one, one, a classic in anthropology is Pigs, Party Secretaries, um, Pigs, Party Secretaries, and Private Lives in Hungary, and that was uh, published in, in Anthropology is one of Anthropology's most uh, form, foremost journals, American Ethnologist. Uh, people still read that. Yeah, uh, very, very much so. The Techno Lineage of State Planning in Mid-Century Hungary. Um, and false numbers as formalizing practices. So this gives you a taste of what's to come. So please join me very much in welcoming back um, Martha Lampland. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Well, I want to say I'm <coughs> very pleased to be here precisely because I was here as a postdoc. It's where my career began and uh, very fun. Of course, those days were in Lane Hall, you know, so I'm walking through. Anyway, I mean, Ann Arbor is not the same. When I saw the Whole Foods, I go, man, this place is changed. Okay. So um, I'm not going to be talking about any of the, the archival materials or the interviews that I did for this project, but if you'd like to ask about it, I can talk about it in the Q&A. So, uh, in 1948, the Communist Party of Hungary proudly declared that its policies would be driven by scientific principles. No longer would workers' wages be determined by their cozy relationship with the boss or by the pernicious dynamics of market fluctuation. It was time to introduce a wage system that was designed solely to reward the hard work of those laboring on the shop floor or in the fields. Within a year, a scientifically calibrated system for determining wages at cooperative farms had been designed. Its pedigree was not Soviet, however, but German. The officials who designed the new wage system were not believers in historical materialism, but were committed to capitalist principles of agricultural economics, having been trained in the 1920s and 30s at the Hungarian Royal Palatine Jozsef Technical and Economics University. While not enthusiastic about the new socialist state, in fact, many of these officials qualified as class enemies, they were grateful to find a community of like thinkers to ply their craft. Today I'm going to tell you how die-hard capitalist economists end up designing the socialist wage system for cooperative farms in Hungary in 1949. This curious episode comes from the book I've just finished entitled The Value of Labor, The Science of Commodification in Hungary, 1920 to 1956. The book is essentially a prequel to my previous work, The Object of Labor, in which I argued that labor was commodified in socialism in the absence of labor markets. 
This claim was based on an analysis of the ways people worked and how they thought about work in the 1980s that were starkly different from earlier patterns in village life in the 1950s and 60s. I had assumed that these changes were the result of socialist policies modernizing the workplace, extending the reach of the educational system, accommodating people to a world of economic planning, and the collectivization of agriculture. I was unable, however, to explain adequately, adequately how socialist policies that restricted labor markets for decades had nonetheless resulted in the pervasive sense that labor, time, and money were intertwined and motivated people's behavior at work and at home. In short, I did not have clear empirical evidence for my claim. I embarked on a study of interwar agrarian e economics and early socialist wage systems to demonstrate convincingly that the commodification of labor can be achieved without markets, an assumption that had been sacrosanct in the study of modern economies. It was also important to demonstrate the role that economists played in designing wages and facilitating com commodification, contributing to the recent debates uh, over the performativity of economics and science studies. You may be familiar with In the first volume of Capital, Marx walks readers through his argument about value and the fetishism of commodities, using simple examples of commensuration by describing goods being exchanged in the town square, an analogy he soon dismantles as he proposes an alternative theory based on labor value. Although 150 years have passed since Marx uh, wrote Capital, common sense, sense still assumes that to commodify goods or labor, they must be bought and sold on the marketplace. This may be a useful way, way of defining commodification in general terms, but it does little to help us understand the process of commodifying labor, that is, the means whereby a wide variety of tasks conducted by disparate groups in many places are rendered commensurate for the purposes of hiring employees and paying them for their services. As a consequence of these complex processes, people come to understand their time as having a monetary value and their efforts to be defined by skill, difficulty, and temporal duration. In other words, labor is reconceived of as a unit of money, time, and activity. We take these procedures for granted, yet they are clearly subject to historical and cultural variation. An important element of my analysis is to draw attention to the substantial infrastructure that makes markets possible usually overlooked by focusing primarily on the reach or efficiency of markets. By infrastructure, I mean a wide range of capacities and institutions, such as universities and technical schools, standards of practice and accounting, contract law, government regulations on labor organization, and forms of trade, etc., that support training and provide services to assist the calculation of labor value and wage design, and resolve disputes arising from these efforts. The fact that in many instances markets dominate the price process of determining the value of labor does not preclude the possibility that other means of achieving the same ends are possible. The question then becomes one of discerning when and where crucial mo moments in the commodification of labor occur and whether they precede, accompany, or exclude marketization. I undertook the initial archival work and interviews for this project in the mid-1990s when debates over the character of post-socialist transitions were raging. What had begun as a study of agrarian work science in mid-century Hungary expanded to consider the dynamics of political and economic transition, though in this case from capitalism to socialism. Studying the transition to Stalinism proved to be an excellent comparative lens on the post-1989 era, sharing as it did so many of the same features, radical economic and political restructuring, reshuffling of politicians and bureaucrats, the significant influence of foreign advisors, a ready-to-hand economic model, and the social upheaval all this entailed. More to the point, optimistic views of the ease of the transition to capitalism in the 1990s relied either explicitly or implicitly on a common view that the Stalinist transition had been swift and comprehensive. The dominant notion was that Soviet officials arrived with a model for an economic and political overhaul in their back pocket, which they gladly shared with their new comrades in arms. Dictated is the better term, as the Soviets and their Hungarian cronies were willing and able to use extensive brute force to achieve their goals. So too, Western advisors swept into Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union in the 1990s, offering a neat package of institutional reforms that would pave the way to capitalism. While the political and economic strains of transition lent urgency to their admonishments, this paled in comparison to Stalinist methods of persuasion and terror. Had the transition to Stalinism been as swift and as effective as we had been taught? If not, then why not? What were the social constraints faced by the Communist Party state at its inception? And did they bear any resemblance to the fits and starts of the post-socialist era? The question about means, how commodification took place, 
led me to explore agrarian work science from the interwar period, while an interest in the character of change motivated the focus on the transition to Stalinism. Tying these two issues together is a third element of the study, that is, a curiosity about how scientific ideas and formalizing practices move from place to place. In recent years, science studies scholarship has consistent demonstra consistently demonstrated that, a sci that scientific practice to take place in particular circumstances. Claims to general knowledge are fashioned post hoc. Additional practice is being required to secure their warrant. These insights also apply to the history of scientific management between the two world wars and its aftermath in factors and fields. If doing science and making policy are contingent processes, does this hold true for technical procedures as well? Or posed a little differently, does it matter if mathematical formulae are understood to be universal signs or contingent projects? Might approach approaching formalizing practices in this way give us greater purchase on understanding the social in social science? I won't be able to answer all these questions today. My goal is to provide a brief overview of how I approach the issues I have raised by discussing the humble work unit's conception, birth, and baby steps in Hungary. What does a scientifically calibrated wage system look like? Let me illustrate by citing a few examples from the evaluative matrix designed in Hungary in the 1950s to reward labor contributions at cooperative farms. Each task in cooperative farming was assigned a daily value, the so-called work unit. Harvesting wheat was worth one work unit. That is, in 1949, cutting 1,200 square fathoms of standing wheat with a scythe over the course of 10 hours was worth one unit. In 1952, it was worth two units. The number of work units for hoeing row crops, such as corn and sugar beets, were calibrated for 10 hours of work and a unit of acreage, but varied according to the density of soils, low, medium, hard. In 1949, spreading manure earned two men each one work unit, calibrated according to the following qualifications, the distance traveled, the amount distributed, and whether the team pulling the cart was made up of horses or oxen. By 1952, only horses were listed as draft animals, and artificial fertilizers dominated the manure section. Now only distance and manner of dispersal, that is mechanized or by hand, were relevant to the classification. For those working with livestock, different variables were taken into consideration. Number of cattle to tend to on a day basis, weight increase, and delivery to the stockyards. In fact, I have show and tell. So you can see, well, we can't, unless you can read Hungarian, which is a privilege, uh, <laughs> you know, you won't, but you'll see the, the numbers. And I also brought the work unit calculator, which I was given by the younger brother of the party secretary, who was an idiot and a sleazeball, his first order. He was probably the only person who ever used this because everyone else who worked in farming could figure out acreage by just looking and they could figure out scales. <laughs> so, uh, check those out. And actually, that, that uh, scale was very similar to one used in manorial farming in the 1930s. Designing this matrix was a monumental effort. Every single activity, from hoeing tomatoes to planting tobacco to artificially inseminating livestock, carried a specific numerical value, the daily level of effort calibrated to accommodate skill and difficulty, as well as local conditions, such as the density of the soil or the steepness of the grade. Precision was paramount. A prominent work scientist who was employed in managing state farms in the 1950s and 60s described it this way, contrasting the Hungarian system with a Soviet equivalent. Oops, where is it? Oh, here he goes. Hungarian practice took off with this mania in pursuit of exacting precision. In Hungary, there were people who were used to this precision, German precision, who said, what's that? The Russians say that the work unit for hoeing corn ranges from 400 to 1,200 square fathoms. What is this bunch of Ivans? I mean, I don't have to explain it another way. Is Ivanic, um, man manage this. What a backward group when the outer limits are so amazingly great. Then we should figure out a large limit that has been influenced by the soil, incline, weediness, rain, etc. Let's build in these criteria and then it will be substantially more accurate. And so it was, but it was impossible to use. Who in the hell traipses out every morning to check whether the ground is moist or not? Who's this great guy? <laughs> Uh, anyway, I did some interviews for this project. <laughs> anyway, he's cool. This gargantuan effort stands in stark contrast to histories of early kolhoz wage schemes in the Soviet Union where the concept of a bread day formed the basis of the payment scheme, a wage that in some cases was in fact allocated to every member of the household, not just those who actually worked at the kolhoz. You know, it's kind of the family wage, so every single member of the family was given this. 
This rudimentary household model of a remuneration is a far cry from the work unit system developed in Hungary. A brief overview of manorial farming in Hungary in the interwar period will explain why. So, uh, a land of three million beggars. This phrase coined by a conservative polemicist accurately depicted the social conditions of village life in Hungary between the two world wars. Unlike its neighbors in the region, Hungary did not conduct a serious land reform after World War I. Now I should go back to the, uh, here's my uh, table. Um, agricultural properties were divided between two kinds of farms, small and medium sized peasant properties and large manorial estates. Uh, but as you can see, uh, you know, a, a large farm was 10 acres or 20 acres or 50 acres, right? The majority of people living off agriculture, however, owned no, little to no land and subsisted by doing day labor, migrant work, or living on manorial estates. So people like this. This is from 1939. Manorial estates in Hungary resembled latifundia and colonial plantations familiar in the New World and Far East an expansive land dotted with small outposts for resident workers and a wealthy owner or renter rarely to be seen in the estate's vicinity. So here's a castle or you know, the, the house of the, the owner of the estate. Among its residents, we would find a steward, 10 coachmen, three farmhands assigned to the coachman, a farm boss, seven general use farmhands, someone in charge of the feed for animals, two dairymen, three cowboys, two pig herders, and one shepherd. You also had craftsmen living on the estate. So this, you can see, this is, this is the story. Uh, you know, I, I realized after a while that people didn't know what a manorial farm was. They thought it was just like a big farm in Kansas. It's like, oh no. Um, there would be a mechanic, a blacksmith, an assistant to the blacksmith, a tractor driver, a cartwright, his apprentice, a stonemason, and someone in charge of the warehouse. Two gardeners and two viticulturalists would be counted among the specialists employed in the estate. The 40-odd families of estate workers were housed in isolated clumps of buildings scattered across the land. In the summer months, approximately 50 migrant workers would come to do all the field work, and all additional tasks throughout the year would require hiring an additional 3,700 days of adult male, la male labor. So these are the kind of people who would do the harvest, who were migrant workers who came for the summer. In contrast to the workers living on the estate, day laborers lived in nearby villages, whereas migrant workers came from farther away, sometimes far-flung counties in poorer regions. Landowners who lived in villages adjacent to or in vicinity of the manorial estates treated estate workers poorly, viewing them as little more than animals, and co considered them to be as foreign to the region as migrant workers were, even though their families may have lived on the estate for generations. Workers residing on the estate were paid on a yearly contract, the more majority of which was composed of goods in kind, a fixed amount of grain, rye, wheat, uh, barley, firewood, in some cases a kilo of bacon, and a measure of salt. A small amount of cash was um, allocated to each household. Housing was provided, if one could call it that. Four large families lived in one room measuring approximately seven square meters. Families were given the right to a small garden plot and often had the opportunity to raise piglets until the age of one. In exceptional circumstances, manorial residents were allowed to keep a cow for milk. Migrant workers were paid with grains and room and board. Only day laborers were paid in cash. What workers earned in yearly contracts or by day labor varied from county to county and sometimes from manorial estate to manorial estate. While the means of recruiting migrant workers resembled a labor market, a labor boss recruited a band of workers every spring, the contractual relationship was usually based on long-term ties between specific villages and particular manorial estates that siphoned off better workers, leaving only a motley crew of obstinate and lazy folk for everyone else. Under these conditions, labor productivity was extremely poor, difficult to improve, and even more difficult to measure. Modernizing production, rationalizing farms to compete internationally, was only a pipe dream. Undaunted agrarian work scientists and econ economic engineers sought to make this dream a reality. The first Department of Economics was established in Hungary in 1920 at the Technical University, followed in quick succession by a department devoted to studying agricultural firms as economic enterprises. This was a bold move. Advocates of this new field had to fight against the res resistance of specialists in agronomy and rearing li livestock who saw agriculture to be their sole domain. 
as well as confront the prejudices of wealthy elites who disdained business and had to be convinced that the study of economics was a legitimate and respectable field. Specialists in agrarian firm studies also faced a poor reception from economists who considered the new fields insufficiently general, insufficiently abstract, right, and therefore not worthy of being called science. Yet by far the greatest impediment to applying their ideas in practice was the indifference shown to their work by owners and managers um, of uh, manorial estates across the country. Undaunted, specialists in agrarian firm studies and the companion fields of manorial accounting and agrarian work science devoted themselves to the scientific study of labor value, management systems, and firm organization with the hope that their research would contribute to modernizing agricultural production overall. While the long-term goal was to strengthen the agrarian economy, immediate tasks were more specific, for example, to develop the scientific assessment of labor value. Treatises proposing various standard metrics appeared in scholarly journals and dissertations. Calculations were guided by the estimates of labor time and uh, commonly accepted by manorial workers, how much time it takes to plow an acre of land with oxen or with horses. And listed in the pages of manorial handbooks, stewards were provided for managing labor. So this is a steward's handbook, among many things. It would be about as thick as that work unit book. These were published from um, at least 1890 until 1945 or 44. I have no, no way of knowing whether stewards used these or not. Most stewards were actually not um, skilled agronomists. They, they were just hired from the, uh, you know, from the Hoover workers there, which was a big beef among the work scientists. They should have skilled agronomists. <coughs> So these are these uh, showing you how, in fact, you calculate the volume of a, you know, a, a pile of potatoes and a pile of, of sugar beets. And then the other one is um, how you uh, calculate um, space, what do you call it, um, uh, area of a geometric plane. Now, if you were a worker in agriculture, you didn't need this shit because you could look at it and figure it out. But anyway, so, um, but anyway, so I, I have no way of knowing whether these were used or not, but they were published every single year often with times with one section that was, you know, talked about labor wages and so on, and another section that was all articles about um, scientific management. It is important to recognize that the new metrics were premised on a standard Hungarian male laborer, so that calculating wages for women and children, as well as ethnic minorities, would require modifications. In short, labor metrics were not abstract models shedding the social particulars of working, but compact indices of local understandings of work embedded in their construction from the start. To evaluate the usefulness of specific metrics of labor value required an additional step, that is the empirical work of figuring the cost of labor at one estate or among similarly managed estates. This was complicated, however, since much of the analysis entailed first calculating commensurate values for the range of products and services paid the manorial workforce. Only then would it be possible to compare costs across, across branches of the farm or between farms. When firm scientists did the calculations, money was the preferred denominator used for figuring labor values. But in many cases, there was no monetary equivalent. I could tell you stories about money was completely unreliable between 1919 and 1946. In such indices, in instances, an index of value was created, such as a unit called the wheat production area that correlated the cost of wheat with yield per acre. So you have these indices that are not um, directly monetary calculations. An index was particularly useful for long-term studies, especially if firms during inflationary spirals when market price and labor costs were unreliable. So if someone studied, you know, before the First World War and up into the end of the 1920s, they would never be able to use monetary uh, equivalents because they're completely unreliable. Commensurating the, commensurating the value of grains distributed to the workforce was easy. Market price was sufficient. But deciding on the value of housing, a corner of a damp room shared with three other families, or the right to gather wood in the forest posed more difficult solutions. These exercises in commensuration could be carried out with pen and paper, and several dissertations were indeed written at the School of Economics on these issues before 1945. Not much more could be done, though, because Hungary lacked the basic elements of an institutional infrastructure agrarian work scientists required to modernize manorial estates. Agrarian economists could only dream of the days when the Hungarian government would keep accurate and up-to-date statistics on firm perform performance as they did in Germany. Or imagine what it would be like to have a network like they had in Germany of private accounting services and county agencies offering farmers advice on bookkeeping and tax regulations. 
In other words, a robust infrastructure supporting modern rationalized production had yet to be built. In an editorial from 1943, a prominent agrarian firm studies specialist proclaimed, quote, since in our country the possibility for accounting is pretty much unknown, there is no basis for establishing private accounting and firm consulting organs. To spread accounting better than this, therefore, can only be done by the state, so that accounting be standardized as well as uniformly institutionalized. Unquote. Unbeknownst to him, his vision of establishing uh, a centralized authority supervising accounting practices would be taken up with a vengeance by the socialist bureaucracy in a few short years. In an article penned in 1947, a left-leaning economist noted the most significant uh, uh, of changes issuing from the introduction of a socialist planned economy is that business management and national economic considerations have become the same. In other words, you know, now you're running the economy like a business, right? This was patently clear in Hungary where planning was a mainstay of government policy be before World War II and was strengthened during the war. So the notion that the state's role in the Hungarian economy radically changed with the communist takeover is inaccurate. Of course, in the coming decade, the state would expand enormously as all sectors of the economy were increasingly subsumed under government control. After all, the balancing role of the market is missing, on the basis of which entrepreneurial decisions are judged in a bourgeois-free economy. From the point of view of the capitalist entrepreneur, to be proper in rewarding profit or inappropriate for inflicting loss. Only one serious solution exists, the widest scientifically organized sustained examination of consumption and production closely tied to the study of reducing operating costs and growing capacity. The practical value of work science soared in the late 1940s. In 1947 and 48, the Work Science and Rationalization Institute, which is actually a, um, was built out of the, work, the Industrial Work Science Institute, offered services to private <laughs> enterprises like norm setting, but also included price surveys and setting output indicators for both physical and white collar workers. By the end of 1947, they had completed or were in the process of negotiating 100 contracts. Government, mi government ministries also came calling for help rationalizing their activities. These included the most powerful and influential ministries engaged in economic planning, the Supreme Economic Council, the Industrial Production Council, the Ministry of Industrial Affairs, the Committee for Setting National Wages, and last but not least, the Planning Office. Within a year, the Institute was absorbed by the National Wage Labor Committee, folding it into an arm of the government. Specialists who worked at the Work Science and Rationalization Institute, or what later came to be called the Work Science and Irrationalization Institute, had backgrounds in industrial firms. None of them had worked in agriculture forcing the party state to seek out specialists in agrarian work science. After all, agrarian economists' vision of modern large-scale agriculture closely resembled the profile of enterprises being established with collectivization. Hiring many prominent agrarian work scientists, however, was problematic because the majority of leading figures would have been designated as class enemies. Their intellectual and political compass had always been turned westward toward Germany. They were allied or associates of the ruling elite during the interwar years and committed to a conservative interpretation of Catholic teachings and social policy. A few of their number working at the Ministry of Agriculture were jailed after a show trial in 1949. Some university and technical college faculty, as well as researchers at economic think tanks, were sidelined, sent into early retirement, or given menial positions at research libraries or translation bureaus. Luckily, there were plenty of members of the Institute for Agricultural Organization within the Ministry of Agriculture who were qualified to design a new wage system for cooperative farms. In late January of 1949, the Institute was given the task of devising a new wage system. They consulted Bulgarian and Soviet wage systems, but ended up using the labor practices from Manoela state handbooks rather than those from uh, their socialist colleagues. On March 6th, approximately six, week, approximately six weeks after receiving their command, the new work unit system was announced in the Communist Party newspaper, and a published version of the, work, of the book was available on the 7th. 110 pages of explanatory text and tables of work unit values. I should say that most Soviet um, materials on agriculture and agronomy um, were not available to Hungarians before about 1951 or 52 because they weren't translated. So they didn't consult Soviet or Russian materials. 
At this point, the story of designing Hungarian work units suggests a strong continuity with earlier practices in manorial estate management and work science. Yet a more careful assessment of the new work unit system reveals significant departures from earlier wage scales in several important ways, such as increased precision and greater formalization. Today I will only mention one crucial innovation, its construction as a matrix that is an internally consistent fixed set of values, no longer a simple list of the time required to complete a job, as you would have had in a manorial book. You know, you'd say, okay, how much can you do in one day with oxen? And so on. Now, uh, the wage system took into consideration skill, physical difficulty, and significance to production. Now this resembles, of course, what was being done in the United States at the same time. This is a cost and production handbook, and you'll see uh, that uh, agrarian, or in this case, industrial ec economists would work out the relative uh, proportion of different f factors in work um, to be able to calculate for different jobs, right? Um, these numbers were, uh, I mean, it's fascinating to see they're very, very similar. The problem is we have no way of knowing how they were implemented in um, capitalist firms because they, we have no access to their categories. We have access to Communist Party documents, however. And so here's another one. You can't see it as well. It's so, so it'll say holding electrode, lifting small parts, 80% sitting, intermittent. So all the different aspects, the physical effort, the skill, and how they would calculate it for any particular job. All right, so these were exactly the same calculations that were being done. Um, in the uh, by agrarian, uh, or excuse me, industrial engineers. <coughs> Cooperative farm members would be allowed to alter, uh, industrial engineers in the 1930s, right? Cooperative farm members would be allowed to alter the amount of acreage required for a task or make accommodations for soils, but the work unit number itself was fixed. It expressed the relative value of each task to all others. A matrix of simple numbers was all that was needed to remun remunerate workers fairly and effectively. The market had been rendered irrelevant. Socialist bounty. Uh, I, could, I have so many great posters. Anyway, the introduction of the work unit did not proceed effortlessly. A review of party documents and con contemporary newspaper articles provide extensive evidence of the difficulties surrounding cooperative farm members' introduction to and adoption of work units. Misunderstandings and disagreements were common. To contend with the problems, party state officials mounted a series of winter seminars for cooperative farm members. In the calm of winter's eve, party lecturers tried their best to explain the work unit system, emphasizing the mechanics of rewarding effort justly. In hopes of making the system easier to understand, the agate prop cadre, you know, those who were charged with taking Marxism-Leninism to the masses, offered simple concrete examples of the way that work units would be assigned on the basis of some task. And unfortunately, in some cases, officials gave inaccurate advice, such as promising that the state would guarantee a fixed monetary amount for each work unit. That was never the case. A recurring problem was the less than enthusiastic performance of officials themselves, which brought stern reprimands from their superiors. In response, the memos written to describe their village visits were overwhelmingly positive. Quote, the agaprop cadre dispatched the farm identified mistakes which the members of the farm realized were their own, and they resolved to put the work unit into practice in the coming years. The members understand that using the work unit is the only way to have a just division of goods." Unquote. That phrasing was exactly the same. I just studied three different counties in every single document in every single place. So obviously it was, you know, a template, what do you call it, a boilerplate. So this is, I think of this as my kind of Chinese poster here. In the first few years of cooperative farming, it was very common for work units to be equally distributed among all members of the farm. In these cases, farm management was accused of the worst possible sin in socialism, egalitarianism. <laughs> this was a central heresy. Socialism, as Stalin had long argued, rejected, the bourgeois, rejected bourgeois egalitarianism. The industrious were to be rewarded and the lazy punished. But as one former explained, members are heard to say, quote, everyone has a stomach. Taking time to record the specific contribution of every member struck cooperative farmers as unnecessary. Here's another quote from the. The opinion of this group, which they have insisted upon, is that everybody worked alike, so why should they bother calculating work units, unquote. The dangers of wage equity feared by the party and prescribed as egalitarianism were overblown. The far more common problem was tailoring the work unit system to suit local social prejudices. 
In a few cases, farm workers wish to pay women less in accordance with earlier practices of differential day labor wages. Of course, this would have only compounded gender inequalities since the work union system already incorporated this implicit gendering of tasks. <clears throat> More frequently, management would vary the number of work units apportioned for different tasks, depending on the alliances, allegiances, or kin status of the cooperative farm member. Cliques internal to cooperative farms were common. Allegiances among extended kin groups or between specific class segments were forged against others. A continuing problem throughout this period was the inclination of brigade leaders and other farm officials to neglect the recording of work units. Work unit books were fudged, numbers being drawn from the air when managers needed to explain their annual budget review. As a general rule, accounting was not taken seriously, considered a burden rather than a necessity. To change these attitudes, the party state took a carrot and stick approach. Competitions were held rewarding bookkeepers who mad mastered the assist new system and farms were increasingly fined for not keeping their accounts in order. So let me conclude. There is a lot more to this history as you can imagine, so I'll just finish with three remarks. The work unit was reworked in 1955, but innovations in the way it rewarded work, such as incorporating quality as well as quantity in the system, were put on hold until after the 1956 revolution when the government backed off collectivization for a few years. Now, it must be said that it was the Soviets who had this way of, who had, ca had suggested that quality of the work be calculated um, in their cooperative farm wage uh, changes in the 1950s. I have no way of knowing whether they did that or not or how they did that. But So it was this, at this point, that idea was adopted by the uh, Hungarians. So, uh, but that kind of um, uh, change didn't occur because of 56. So when they collectivized finally in the 60s, Cooperative, uh, work for, uh, cooperative work units uh, were used to remunerate um, members until the late 1960s or 70s, at which time weekly envelopes of cash were introduced. A lucky few were paid according to piece rates, such as combine drivers in harvest season, but everybody else at the farm was stuck with hourly rates. My friend who initially explained the work unit system to me was the, the opinion that eliminating the work unit was a bad idea. When I asked him how he would account for poor work habits of the farm members, he pointed to the demise of the work unit. Mor morale deteriorated, he said, when we moved to money. In other words, the work unit had become naturalized, seen as the proper measure of labor value. Even though the new monetary wage system was built on the labor values of work units, it was clear that the immediate bond between effort and reward was now broken, given rise to significant increases in the inequality of the distribution of cooperative assets. Like tractor drivers got paid twice as much as, you know, women were paid uh, in the garden section were paid by an hour and not by piece rate. They could have finished everything by noon and gone home to do the wash, but they had to do hourly wages. The transition to socialism was difficult and prolonged. Expertise was a problem, as was administering the new party state. In relation to expertise, only in 1955 could the head of major research institute on economic matters confidently proclaim that he was able to hire new employees properly trained in Marxist-Leninist political economy. That is, seven years after Communist Party take, takeover, you didn't have any economists who were doing Marxist-Leninist policy. Until then, the party state had to rely on large part on bourgeois economists to write policy, even though in public, communists castigated them as pernicious forces worse, working against the new society. Plenty of party hacks walked the halls of research institutes and ministries, but Communist Party leaders regularly conceded in memos and notes of party meetings that they needed the help of well-trained specialists. The majority of the Hungarian population in the early 1950s experienced the state as an arbitrary and anarchic mechanism. These problems have been well documented, especially in relationship to the Ministry of the Interior. Based on archival evidence and interviews, however, I would like to complicate the picture. It is very clear from the documents I surveyed that much of the bureaucratic work of the party state in the early 1950s was devoted to expanding the state's capacities and modernizing its functioning. Large components of work at the Ministry of Agriculture could just as easily have been conducted at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Banal, everyday work, writing memos, reviewing policies, answering correspondence from cooperative farm presidents, and adjusting expectations on what could and could not be accomplished according to timelines they had set for themselves in monthly meetings. In the next decade, many of the initial attempts at setting policy and institutional procedures would settle in as practice. Technical colleges would train a whole new generation of agricultural specialists. 
Courses on new mechanized equipment would be offered to members of cooperative farms, and bookkeeping will be, would be accepted as legitimate and necessary task for running a farm. In factories and state businesses, people got used to working shifts of a specific duration for a set wage and learned that being on time was a requirement of all workers. The range of capacities and institutions necessary to modernize the economy and create new socialist citizens would solely consolidate and have effects. My analysis of commodification has ben benefited immensely from the debate over the performativity of economics and the wider discussions of accounting, finance, and markets that has blossomed in science studies over the last decade. That said, I actually began this project assuming that economists would play a significant role in designing cooperative farm wages. In fact, it was precisely the active role of, agrarian, of agricultural economists and work scientists and then socialist policymakers in crafting this tool, tool that intrigued me. In contrast to examples in the performativity literature where the initial innovation was not intended to change economic practice, as in the history of the Black-Scholes equation that Mackenzie talks about, in this instance, pioneers in scientific management boldly espoused a new economic order. Their enthusiasm was constantly on display, expressed in the num numerous publications they issued explaining not only how, but why they would propose rationalizing production to alter behavior so substantially. The analytic, t t t ugh, the analytic task then became exploring how the sci these scientific models would actually take shape in the form of policies and practices, paying keen attention to all the steps along the way, whether they be technical specifications or bureaucratic maneuvers. Excuse me, I'll just. I was fascinated by the history of scientific management because I could never figure out how these apparently elegant models promising higher productivity were to be adopted for use in factories and firms. The reigning assumption, of course, was that the models expressed the causal mechanism linking effort to reward. But as I argued at the outset, scientific models aren't intended to be, well, I didn't mention this, but <laughs> aren't intended to be implemented in business plans or policy statements. Scientific models are tools to think with, puzzle about, play with. So the wage schemes were merely kindling to ignite creative management reforms. In other words, the formidable engineering of people and places scientific management demanded was always built from the ground up. It became clear that I had been misreading the meaning of numbers and work science formulae and metrics of value because you'll get these, you know, classic physics, you know, so much effort, work, you know, energy. Those are the kinds of, you know, formulae you see in these publications. I realize that numbers only mean something in context. They are indexical, expressed in local terms for specific purposes. Accordingly, I no longer viewed numbers as disembodied symbols on a page, but recognized them to be plump figures serving local interests. This meant, however, that elegant metrics of labor value could not stand on their own. They required the support of institutional bodies that shared their interests and would develop their capacities to reach this goal. In short, commodifying labor by designing precise wage systems would only, be fin only finally be possible if an infrastructure supporting the science of work and the modernization of production were in place. One might say, then, that the history of cooperative farm wages, work science, and agrarian economics constitutes a case of strong performativity that is a clear example of social scientific principles, in this case, processes of valuing labor and agriculture, economics, and work science, being directly incorporated into national policy and actual work practice, wage practice in farming. You know, performativity debate saying, you know, do economists, does the co work of economists influence the character of the economy? I would frame the issue in slightly different terms. My approach has been to examine the commodification of labor as an historical accomplishment, a process whose features vary in time and place. I've argued that the role of markets in commodifying labor has been exaggerated, overshadowing other possible means of defining and assessing the value of labor. In the history recounted here, social scientists, work scientists and agricultural economists, took an active role in defining and evaluating labor value, developing techniques that were incorporated into wage systems at cooperative farms. They also played an important role in campaigning for and setting the groundwork for the institutional infrastructure needed to apply the techniques that they had championed. Though not intended initially to sidestep market forces, these techniques, embedded in the matrix of labor value called the work unit, did in fact contribute to a transformation of people's attitudes about work, time, and money in a centrally planned economy where market forces were actively suppressed. Examining the means by which commodification was achieved would not have been understood if we consigned the techni technicalities to an afterthought. 
Without incorporating the study of the material investments and infrastructural features, the techniques and formalizing practices, like these commensuration exercises, for example, into our analyses of the practices of social scientists and policymakers, we are unable to account for the contingency of historical processes. Analyzing formalizing practices as tools engineered to task shifts our attention away from peripatetic models of scientific managers to the groundwork required to rationalize the workplace itself. Far from the image of scientists adopting a bunch of formulae which they immediately put to work rationalize the workplace, that is a top-down approach to the study of innovation, we must in fact work from the bottom up. It is only by plowing through the cumbersome, heavy technical details that we will understand how formal systems are born. The stark numbers we see, will eventually see in the work, units, uh, <laughs> work unit value matrix are the product of thoroughly social processes, not the crystallization of isolated elements. In short, contrary to their usual depiction, projects of commensuration and quantification are tethered to time and place. They do not float away from history. It follows then the questions need to be asked about the cultural specificity and historical contingency of formalizing practices, be they wage schemes in mid-century Hungary or the numbers, formulae, and models used in the social sciences more generally. Attending to these complexities provides us with tools then to explain why the adoption of apparently similar formalizing practices can result in substantially different historical trajectories. So, thank you. Yes. I thought it was really, really fascinating at the end when you spoke about the, the numbers and the wages and the values of the work units as indexicals that are doing work, but they're performative. So that one way to look at it is as just a, as kindling to motivate work management to change in certain ways. And then it seemed that as you went on, you were discussing the kinds of contingent technicalities that would make that performativity do something in other directions. And that's why I was thinking about it. it what extent, how can we understand the work of the wage value as something that would convince people to do the work? It seems to me that was something that, um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't, um, I'm not as knowledgeable about linguistics as you are, no, but no, no, I don't no, think of indexical necessarily no, as being performative. No, no, but it can be, right? It can be interpreted yeah. as there's yeah. a pointer that's showing us that yeah. there's a possible relationship, and so therefore let's try that's right. to make it happen. That's right. So, yeah, it's the pragmatics, yeah, right? Pragmatics. So numbers are not, you know, it, in that book, great book by, um, now I can't remember his name, writes about uh, mathematics and anthropology. Yeah. No, he I says that, you know, uh, mathematics has done away with dikes. Yeah, but in yeah. fact, every formula right. is indexical. So, so I thought that was really interesting to think about the managers imagining, okay, so we're, we're seeing the value represented this way, which makes us then want to try to arrange work value this way. But they're also trying to stimulate the workers. So then you've got all these workers interpreting the value of wages. And Managers are hoping that the workers will see those numbers and then maybe they'll think, wow, I can get double the work unit yeah. if I do this yeah. really yeah. hard job. Yeah. But it's not working and people aren't doing yeah. the work and the numbers yeah. are being fudged and so on. So, so it's failing, right? Yeah. Then that kind of well, initially. Way. Initially. So, so then I was wondering if you could tell us more about the contingent technicalities that are making things fail or not. And the only thing I could think of in terms of contrast would be the Russian case, the period when it didn't matter how much you earned, you couldn't really do anything with it. So yeah, yeah. Just why would anyone sort of see those numbers as pointing to anything that had value? So then the, they, there were no, they couldn't perform anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah, but that's not only the only technicalities I'm thinking yeah. about. I'm thinking about the fact that if you read those 1930s uh, production cost mm -hmm. management manuals, they will say, this is how you pay workers, but remember, workers in the South are lazier than workers in the North. Okay. So you have that yeah. ethnicity is yeah. already in the way that these you know, manorial worker or management uh, scientists would say, okay, this is how we calculate wages, but remember, if they're German, you have to pay them like this. If they're Romanian, you have to pay them like this. So all that is already built in, right? Mm -hmm. So in f Exactly. Yeah. So if you introduce these kinds of technicalities in a German economy with very different assumptions about what wage who's a worker and who's a good worker, you'll have very different ways in so which those... So are they trying to work that into the system instead of using the system to mask what they think is a universalizing rubric of labor as a plan explaining to 
Well, the way I interpret it is not it's not that they're masking, it's that in fact the very way that you do the commensuration assumes the social differences between different kinds of groups and also that those have to be implemented management. So if you read these management um, books in the 1930s, they'll say, you know, this is very good, but you have to really be a good manager because you have to figure out to make sure that you're implementing the, in these ways. So I mean, I'm trying to argue that in fact that the numbers are all, have these little people inside already and then the people inside um, are the ways in which the management will try to, in fact, make people work, right? So they assume that if you're Romanian, you're not going to work right. as hard, right. so you have to put them into a different right. research. Oops. So, Elena, if, you, oh, if you're going to continue, maybe you oh. should talk to <coughs> them. Oh. Well. Right. oh, that's okay. So <laughs> anyway, uh, no, I, I have this thing. So, so in other words, what that means is that, that um, they've already um, incorporated those assumptions into it, right? And then the management was supposed to take those into consideration in the way in which they motivated workers. Now, ideally, what they wanted was that they would actually pay them in money. And then there were all these psychological assumptions about money making people work harder. But it doesn't, yeah. You know, if it's not, I mean, first of all, it did, the productivity wasn't related to, anyway, it's, there are all kinds of reasons why it didn't work out, but eventually it does, right? So for me, the question was not, you know, were workplaces rationalized? We know that there's a radical difference in the way that people worked in the 19, let's say, 70s and the 1920s but I want to know how it was rationalized. Yeah. And you have to figure out how it is that they start to do these little piddly, you know, numbers and crunching and, and defining wages so that people who get differ differentiated, mm -hmm. right, will be paid differently. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, anyway, I don't know if it's convincing, but the, but the point is that, you know, people always say, well, they come in with these little formulae and they just fill in the formulae. And I'm saying the formulae with the practices of commensuration are already from the beginning already incorporating just the very virtue of being able to define the labor of value means you're already incorporating all the social dimensions of it. But then someone's going to come in and say, they, they seem to be contesting that too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it'll yeah. take 20 or 30 years for people to, but that's what the thing is, that, you know, they would talk about Taylorism and agriculture and they go, well, you know, it takes about 20 or 30 years for workers to be convinced that this is how they should work. Yeah. So these minor, you know, management guys were not, didn't have illusions about it, but they thought that if they got money it would happen sooner and, yeah, so the assumption was that it was going to take a long time to convince people to do this. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, did I answer your question? Uh -huh, thank you. Okay, uh, well, I have a short question about your time frame. Why do you stop at 1956, Six. or is it just for this presentation? And No, no, no. I stopped in 1956 because this is kind of a big project. So I studied um, agrarian economists in the 20s and 30s, read all their dissertations, read the newspaper, the weekly newspapers of wealthy manorial estate owners, looked at all the columns where they're advocating, you know, accounting and everything. So that was a big project. And then, between 1948 and 1956, I uh, read all the documents at the party level, at the national level, and then also did field work in three different, did archival work in three different counties. So I'm reading all the documents of the socialist state on agrarian wages between 1948 and 1956, which is a lot of fucking work, right? <laughs> so, so and and the, this is exactly what, you know, that kind of, the problem is that people don't, actually do the work of reading the documents. So I was actually reading them all the way f at the top to see what they were doing. Because it was interesting, when I first went to the field, everyone says, well, just read the, what the Central Committee is doing, and then you'll know what policy is. And I go, but the Central Committee doesn't write the actual policy. It's the people who work in the offices that write the policy. I'm, I'm not supposed to, you know. So I had to read those guys. And then, of course, that would just tell me the national level. And initially, I didn't think I could actually learn anything at local level because cooperative farms didn't have, um, party uh, secretaries usually, whereas every factory had a party secretary and every week they'd write a party. So I thought, how in the world am I going to find out what's happening? But, if I went, but when I went to the county level, there were um, party offices at the county level and there were also government offices, right, at, at the county level. So I read both of those documents and then I read all the documents describing what was going on in each of the different, um, what do you call it, the, um, you know, the subset set of a county, right? So I'm reading a lot of stuff, and, and I wanted to just connect that 30s to the 50s because I had already suggested that by the 1980s it had this effect. I could, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was a big project. I couldn't have done more, yeah. 
<coughs> Thank you so much for this uh, great presentation. Um, I wanted to just clarify or make sure I understood that y you seem like y you're kind of missing a kind of a gap about just the, what's available in terms of, you know, how they actually kind of, how the managers kind of actually implemented these systems. But I was curious if you were able to know, like, you know, who, who was doing the reporting of the numbers, whether it was the farmers actually self-reporting or was it the managers kind of evaluating them, and whether the implementation of any of these kind of systems kind of changed the work dynamics especially considering, you know, the manorial estate where they're not really overseeing the work and then you have kind of guys that come in and they're really, you know, checking or do they kind of believe the workers to accurately self-report, um, you know, did they work till five or did they take off at three? You know, this, these kind of, kind of details, I was very curious if you had any. Yeah, I mean, I didn't actually make this very clear that nobody implemented this shit. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I have my language. Nobody took this seriously. I mean, these guys would go out and they would put um, a, an oxygen mask on somebody's head and figure out how much oxygen it took to cut the cuts off. I mean, and a lot of people thought that there was, there's a, actually a Hungarian movie about this. They thought these guys were nuts. And who in the, you know, they're trying to, what they want to do is increase productivity. The only way you could earn money during the re recession or whatever depression was, you increase productivity. But you never influence the prices on the international market. Yeah. So you had to increase productivity. But nobody who was, uh, owned a manorial estate would ever have, first of all, hired a steward for money and paid them, paid any of the manorial workers in cash, altered any of the, I mean, the amount, see, this is the thing about, I'm trying to argue about the infrastructure, the amount of bureaucratic institutional development you need to actually even implement the system, no one wanted. Mm -hmm. They completely blew these guys off. And it's interesting precisely because these guys were very powerful, they all worked at the university, they were all very much high up in the relationship to the Ministry of Agriculture. And so they were kind of hobnobbing with all these wealthy aristocrats, and none of them took them seriously. You know, they had like three or four dissertations. You have lots of, I mean, every single week, the agrarian or the agricultural economics um, column, make sure that you consider bookkeeping is a great idea. You know, and every single, so it never took off. And then these guys are sitting around kind of pissed because these great ideas were never implemented. I think in the industrial conditions, I think some of these were, but not in agriculture. And then the, so the communists come in and say, we want to have a scientific wage. And they go, well, we've been working on this thing, you know. So that's when it gets implemented. And that's why going to the county level and seeing how people would say, we're not going to write this shit down. Are you crazy? And, and so that's a whole other part of the story. So, you know, people, they didn't take it seriously. They didn't think it was fair. They didn't make any sense. Why, why should we do this differently? And then you start to get... What's really interesting is that, but this is another whole story, that people start to take the numbers very seriously in 53-54 when Nadimra, you know, he allowed people to leave cooperative farms after Stalin died, right? So a lot of the people who had joined the farms under, under dress who had been wealthier left. And the people who first joined cooperative farms in Hungary, and this is true all throughout Eastern Europe, were proletarians. You know, they didn't have their own land. They might have gotten some of the land from them. They didn't have any tools. So the people who first joined cooperative farms were people who aligned with each other so they could actually farm together. When the wealthier people left, they wanted to be paid for their work units. And those guys said, fuck, you know, you left. I'm not going to pay. So there were all these um, actually um, court trials. I mean, there are all these big, you know, legal suits about who could get paid and whether they should be paid because this happened like it. June, and you have to have 220 work units to be paid for a year. So what happens is, because the, the, co the cooperative farm members initially ones who never owned land didn't recognize that having land and contributing that to the farm meant value, and the people who left the thing thought they had already contributed value to the farm. And so you get this huge fight, and people start to pay attention to the numbers because they want to say, screw you, you left a cooperative farm, I'm not going to pay you any money. And then the county steps in and says, well, yes, you have to pay this person, but no, you don't have to pay that person. And that's when it starts to become more specific. And then the, also the state accounting agencies, which I think were also very powerful in the Soviet Union, they start to get much more, um, a lot more oversight, right? And they start to really demand these numbers. I mean, that's what the paper on false numbers is about, why you can have bookkeepers who submit false numbers in the early 50s and that doesn't matter to the state. But by 1954 and 55, it starts to matter. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah. I was really intrigued by that story of the, of the farmers who wanted to think about <coughs> fairness in value as equal, and then the resistance from, from the state. 
So it, it, it sounds like, I mean, fairness in value is what the labor theory of value is supposed to be about. Yeah. Um, but what I'm hearing from your presentation is that there are these competing visions uh, of what fairness is. Uh, and exactly how uh, it seems that defining that particular term is maybe the key to some of these arguments that are that are happening. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the different the varying conceptions of fairness. So is fairness the person who works hardest? So put the oxygen mask on and that's the person who works hardest? Uh, which sounds like a Marxist, the sort of classic Marxist theory of value, but then you're also mentioning these uh, people who have greater skill, more valuable skill. And as soon as you say that, you're talking about fairness in terms of a sort of backward, uh, uh, genuine commodification in a capitalist sense, commodification of, of labor value. Uh, so I, I wonder if you could talk okay, a little so more the, about how it spins the, out. Um, well, there are two questions there. So it's one, the question about how the um, agrarian economists decided how to remunerate what the value of labor was. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other question about how, what people thought they should be paid. Right. Right. So the, um, you know, as I showed you with this production catalog, the idea was precisely to be able to, to actually distinguish all these different features, skill, physical difficulties. They weren't as developed in the 1930s because, of course, they weren't even out, able to kind of implement it in any kind of actual system. Right? But the assumption was that if you were more skilled, you would pay, be paid more, right, for the work that you did. So, for example, if you look at the work unit, Thing. If you um, shoveled uh, manure in the courtyard, you get 0.75. And if you are officially inseminated cows, you get 2.5, right, for a day's work, right? So those things were built into the work unit system. But those distinctions were not the kinds of distinctions that had been made in manorial estate um, accounting or the way people had remunerated each other in the, in the village before the war. So the way in which, you know, if you, you know, someone asked you to come and help pick their corn, You'd go for a day, and then they'd ask you to come and help with their grades. So you go, you, it wasn't task to task. It was time to time. So the idea that you would, which is why the matrix becomes really important, the idea that if actually you would start to differentiate the physical difficulty and the skill, and that would be incorporated into the calculation of who gets paid what, that was new. And that's what people didn't understand. What's the point? You know, we're just all working together. We're all working the full day. It's th it's so they had a temporal matrix and nothing else, and this had a more developed, highly developed skill matrix. I guess I don't understand the idea of skill either, uh, because if I'm thinking in this Marxist, I if I'm thinking, it's not a Marxist system. Well, there, there, that's the thing that's puzzling me that I'm trying to get my hand on. So, so there's these these the people writing these matrix matrices, the people from the center, or from the top, who are coming up with these matrices, are matrices, are are thinking in terms of skill. Skill isn't fair uh, in a certain sense. That is, you know, I just happen to have more skill, so I get more money. Well, uh, it's fair if you think that, you know. It's fair if you're in a capitalist meritocracy, but it's not supposed to be fair in a Marxist labor. Th it doesn't matter what a Marxist it is. It just doesn't matter to this even is the economists. But, but, but the economists who are at the top, they are supposed to be. No, working. no, no, no. They're no, not. Wait, no, no. They don't even care. No. Okay. All the guys who are writing this work system are writing, they're taking the capitalist system. Mm hmm. Yeah. You don't have bourgeois egalitarianism in so socialism. You have to be paid more for if you work harder. Work harder, but working harder and yeah, having so more work talent. Work. Those are very different things in terms of theories of fairness. Work harder and if you have more skill. Oh. Those, are in, those were in fact, so if you look huh. this is what they, these guys, are, these agrarian engineers are doing, I mean uh, industrial engineers. So they already figure out, according to East Pat, what the percentage of skill is going to be. Hmm. And the reason that it's so much fun to do this project is that you would never, ever be able to follow how this scientifically calibrated system is implemented on the shop floor in capitalism yeah. because you could never get access to the firm records, even if they had them, telling you how they were implemented. Hmm. But the nice thing about this thing is the arch of, so you have the whole, all these studies in the 1920s and 30s telling you how they're going to design it. And then with the centralized state, which is great, you know, for archival work, you know, you have all the documents about how they tried to implement it and how it worked. So the, um, whoops. Um, so when, when I quoted those articles from 1947 and they talked about fairness, these were the articles in, a, in an economics uh, journal that was a kind of left-leaning. 
So it was, you know, in principle, but what there they meant by fairness was that it wasn't, you weren't paid according to whether you were in with the boss, you were paid according to the character of your work. And then, of course, you would be, it would be skill, and it would be hard. And so, so, that, so that's the point. This is not, although, of course, it is kind of a labor theory, but it's interesting, well, there, well, I won't get into that. There's a whole theory about money and labor, I, sorry. So yeah, it's not, it's, that's not Marxist. They didn't have Marxist Leninist economists until 1955. This was made in 1949 in six weeks. Um, this is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> um, and Brian's question just makes me uh, think about what you said at the end, which is that to think about commodification of labor is not, as the market not being necessary and capitalism not being necessary to commodification um, and thinking like, I think your work speaks more broadly to 20th century rationalization, forwardism, Taylorism, scientific thought, and expert knowledge as being something that transcended economic political systems. Um, so anyway, just making that up. But my question is some, something much more. I just didn't, I wanted you to clarify a little bit. I, I didn't understand how you kept talking about people being paid, but then when they got cash, that was in the envelopes, that was different. So I, I just must have missed something. I just wondered if you could yeah, yeah, elaborate yeah. why, <coughs> what it was, why was cash different than getting paid for your work units? Because, but let me just speak to the point before. Yeah. Because the problem with a lot of the assumptions about labor markets is that all the work that you would have to do to study how these kinds of systems were implemented in factories, in industrial contexts in the United States, in Britain, in Germany, it's all invisible. So the, you know how they talk about internal labor markets in, in firms, right? But you have the idea that this is, this, is not a, this is not a market system, right? And the ways in which all of these factories were calculating labor in the 1920s, 30s, uh, if you worked in a steel factory, this is how they figured out the rate. Now, it may very well be true that between two factories, the market might incline that this guy's going to pay a little bit more than that. But all the um, active intervention of managers and you know, work scientists to kind of define the value of labor is invisible because you have you can't track it because you have no way of finding out what happened. Right. So so that's already why the market is problematic, right? Because um, and also because you need all this infrastructure. You need to be able to figure out how much you know. You need to be able to write things down. You need to be able to have teach you know, and all that stuff. You know, there's a great book uh, article by Tevano on um, investment and form, and he says people forget that, you know, to be able to have these kind of standardized practices, you have this huge investment on all this infrastructure to make it work. So the thing about cash is that um, I didn't go into a lot of specifics. So you were, um, I mean, the biggest problem with the worker unit essentially was that it was supposed to be a productivity wage, but people didn't get paid till the end of the year. So presumably you were going to get paid how hard you worked each day, which you would do, right? But what you did was you calculated how, mu how much people worked each day, you wrote it down, and at the end of the year, you figured out how much profit the cooperative farm made, and then you figured out the monetary value of those work units, and that's how much you got paid, right? So if you worked 220 work units, and it turned out that the profit allowed you to have 714 per unit, that's how much, right? But if you only worked 103 units, then you only got that much, right? But when they shifted to a monetary wage away from work units per se, it meant that all the women were paid on an hourly basis. There was no calculation about how much they work. They could have worked just as hard, you know, and actually they, if they'd hit, see the thing is piece rate, that's what people wanted. They wanted piece rate, which is what the work unit was, except that it got messed up because it pulled the result away from the, the action, right? It, it destroyed the connection between effort and reward, right? Which is why it was kind of didn't work anyway. But um, so they wanted a piece rate, but only the tractor drivers got piece rate because they were the boys and they were high in the hierarchy and the women got screwed because they worked on an hourly wage. And there was no incentive to work harder in an hour if you get screwed like that. And that's why money fucks it up because, it, I mean, it wasn't the money per se, it was the fact that they had um, altered the ways in which people's value of labor was identified. But it was expressed in money. So I'm going to give it over. I just want to make one quick interjection about how a lot of the shared services that we're undergoing as a university <laughs> is exactly the beginning of your talk sounded exactly like that. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I'll just a quick note. You know, I wrote this paper on false numbers. Mm -hmm. And I, um, you know, in my first book I wrote, you know, what happens when a state represents itself as a science and planning and all these numbers. So I thought all this kind of calculations with numbers was um, 
you know, a socialist project. And then you get to the California, University of California. <laughs> you know, you find out, you know, this kind of bureaucracy. So I'm sitting in a meeting. You know, I'm in, I'm in the faculty committee that decides where buildings are going to be placed on campus and the, who are going to be architects and so on. And we're having this debate in 1999 when they thought that the, in, the number of students would increase. Double, they would double, right? So we're talking about parking spaces on campus. And there are a bunch of faculty members and bureaucrats. And they said, well, we're going to increase the parking spaces by this much. And the faculty members said, that's, that's not many more parking spaces. You know, I mean, that's only 2,000. You know, why aren't we having more? And we went around and around about this for like 20 minutes. And I mean, part of it, well, they didn't want to say publicly they're going to have a lot more parking places, because then La Jolla would freak out that there are all these people driving through the town. But OK, so, so they, they wanted to restrict the number of parking places, right? But the faculty knew that that wasn't going to be enough and they would never get a parking place. They don't get to work at 7.30 like the bureaucrats. They come in at 10.30, right, you know. Uh -huh. And already we pay like 90 bucks for a dumb parking place a month and we still can't. Buy. Hey, okay, so, <laughs> so this guy sits next to me and he says, we have explained this to you five times. Why don't you? I said, I do not understand. And one, I, one guy actually said, well, why can't you just have a bigger figure? And finally the head of accounting, of finance, the whole University of California, San Diego said, it's just a false number, okay? It's just a false number. And that's when I knew that it's all about rationalization, that it doesn't matter because in the process of negotiation mm -hmm. about parking places for putting the plan together, it doesn't matter if it was 50 or 2,500. But it does matter once it leaves that room. But that's why you can have all kinds of provision, what I call provisional numbers that are very effective, you yeah. know, pragmatically, yeah. that have nothing to do yeah. with, but there are things like, for example, tax records are provisional numbers. And if you look at um, Wall Street estimates of markets, they're all provisional numbers because by the time, they're all guesses. And then, of course, by the time you get to June or whatever, completely irrelevant. So these are all very general practices. These are not, yeah, they're not even capitalist socialists. They're well, um, I have another question. As you are speaking about this uh, commodification of labor, uh, well, in capitalism, it happens uh, under the market system, and that's what makes it a commodity. But under socialism, of course, money is paid, and there are different amounts that are paid, but it's not, it's not the market, a market system. The government gives you the money, and um, does it commodify your labor if it is, well, we are all <coughs> contributing, I've lived in, I, I lived in that system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are all contributing our work to the, the how should I say it, the, the yeah. for the benefit of the, of, of, of the nation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and you are getting something back, and you know that what you are getting back is not just you know, the measurement of, of the monetary measurement of, of, of monetary measure of yeah. what you've, you've done. It's just yeah. the government gives you something for you to, to survive, and the rest is just distributed because there's free health care and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. the system, Schools, et cetera, yeah. So uh, is it a commodification of labor under socialism or? or so the, the, the key here is that, for me, the notion of the commodification of labor means that people come to assume that their actions have a monetary value and take place in a certain amount of time. So when someone says to you, you know, I could, you know, if I move to this different factory, I'll get 17 fortieths an hour instead of 11. That's a commodified way of thinking, even though it has nothing to do with the market. Because the, uh, the issue of the commodification is the way in which you equate money and action and time. That's the commodification, right? So like mm -hmm. in the village, you know, I, another example is if you had a cow and you're an older person and you didn't have this commodified worldview, you'd say a cow is a cow. And young people would have a cow because they're going to buy a bedroom set. That's commodification. You don't have to have a market debt. Commodification. commodification means that you think about your labor time as having monetary value or some index of value. It doesn't matter. But it means you've cut it up into little bits and pieces. So the commodification is not that you go out and sell your labor on the market. The commodification is altering the ways in which you want to understand the nature of your own work, how it's rewarded, and how it's structured. So that's why these technicalities make all the difference, because it's, these are the technicalities that make it possible for people to think about their labor time in these units. Um, and it's not, it's not the money, and it's not who's paying you or not. And, the thing is, and what's problematic is that this is exactly true in most capitalist systems, except it's invisible because people don't have access to it doing exactly the same thing within industry, and then you can have moderations as is set out in the labor 
Arabic, but all this is, is um, completely unknown. And it, you know, and not as if people haven't studied scientific management, you know. Oh, okay. I'll try to make it quick. Okay, sorry. And I, this is a more basic question about experts and expertise in the interwar. So you talked about economists, agronomists, various. Um, but I'm wondering about um, sociologists and thinking about um, the kinds of arguments that are going on in places like interwar Romania, where sociologists are involved in these in. Um, the construction or the arguments, the plans for these um, model villages or also in places like fascist Italy where a lot of the um, reform of or intervention into the agrarian is about rationalization of the built environment and space and the way that will help to rationalize the farmer family. So do you see... Oh, like there's nothing. I don't know of anything like that. And I mean, if I studied architects in the 20s and 30s, I could possibly see. But the sociologists at this time are... Um, I mean, I have a chapter in the book about how uh, the, so the kind of leftist sociologists versus these economists, these very conservative economists who are very Catholic, you know, this very... Um, debate about the value, how you would go about rationalizing. And they have debates over calories, for example. You know, how much calorie do you earn, do you eat if you're working on a manorial estate? And they, they fight because the, I mean, the, these big manorial estate guys wanted California agriculture. Get rid of the stupid peasant. We don't want the peasant. We want workers and we want mechanization. And that's why collectivization was actually the same, right? Whereas the, the people on the other end would say we want land reform and we want small farms and we want people to have you know, garden hungry, where you would have very intensified production, right? And that was the debate. And so they constantly would debate over, you know, how many children do you have in these families of people who are manorial states, because they Democrat people. How many calories do they eat? They eat better if they're not peasants. You know, all these kinds of, so they had, the you know, and they had, they argued over what you might think of as scientific kinds of calibration, but it wasn't over space. I, I haven't ever seen anything. You know, because the, the manorial estates were so, they don't, they kind of contravened what was called the Geneva Convention of Space, so they're already kind of in bad shape. <laughs> they're hopeless. Yeah. 